when you look at multi-generational farming, like the time horizon of, like it's not just my parents farming for themselves to sell it. It's my parents farming for themselves and the next generation and to pass it along and, and leave it better than it was. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Welcome back to the Real Food, Real People podcast, where we believe it's so important to know where your food came from and of all the things that you can consume that you that are grown here in Washington State, probably nothing more important as far as knowing where it came from than wine. The, it's so attached to place. And we haven't had a lot of wine conversation here on the podcast. So we're going to find out today how wine in Washington State is grown, how important soil and place and climate and all of these things are, and just get a great perspective from someone who produces wine start to finish, not just one piece of the puzzle. Um, she's taking the wine world by storm. Her name is Carrie Shields. We talk with her in Sunnyside, Washington. She grows the grapes, does the farming, and then she's also the winemaker at the winery. She makes the wine, connects with customers start to finish, and she has a really cool story to share. She is a very smart person and has a huge amount of background in how wine works and what is so cool about wine here in Washington State. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dairy Farmers of Washington. Want to thank them for supporting these conversations. Um, with their support, we're able to connect people with real local farmers, including dairy farmers here in Washington State. They do that as well at wadairy.org. Check out their website again, wadairy.org. You can even take a virtual farm tour there. So check them out. Thank you to Dairy Farmers of Washington. Also, thank you to Mana Insurance Group. Um, they insure farmers as well as any regular old person, including myself. It's where I get my insurance uh, for my vehicles, my home, etc. They do all kinds of different stuff, and they're great people. I always believe that relationship and that trust is more important than anything else uh, when you're doing those kinds of things. So I, I'm so appreciative of their support for the podcast at Mana Insurance Group, manainsurancegroup.com. Williams, uh, powering your clean energy future, and as well supporting the podcast with a community grant. So thank you to them. And also thank you to Washington Red Raspberries for supporting the podcast with a grant uh, a sponsorship as well. Without further ado, now let's go to Sunnyside, Washington, where we talk with wine and grape farmer and winemaker, Carrie Shields. So I don't think I've ever had this before in a podcast where we actually have the food, well, in this case, the drink that someone produces mm -hmm. here with us to have on the podcast. So this could be your best episode ever. It may be, <laughs> depending on how many of those bottles we go through. Well... But I'll make some more if we run out. <laughs> so we, before we get into all of your story and how wine is made and all these cool things, tell us about what we have here in front of us, because I really want to get on with, uh, with tasting this. Now, what's, what's the right way to do this? You <laughs> well, this is a swirl. carriage house. It's a red Bordeaux blend. Um, okay. So give it a little swirl. Mm -hmm. That gets all the aromatics into the, into the glass and into the headspace. Mm -hmm. And then s sniff it. Stick your mm -hmm. nose in there. And smell all those beautiful dark red fruits, mm -hmm. and uh, and then take a sip. And you can swish it around in your mouth and taste all the different flavors and textures and things yeah. like that. So this is uh, it's called Carriage House. It's one of our largest production wines. We make about eight hundred to a thousand cases of this every year, mm -hmm. which for us is big, but for yeah. the wine world, it's tiny. It's nothing. Yeah. Um, but this is but isn't that what everyone loves is the tiny winery, not the big production. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Because they have more stories and there's you really can't yeah. give a sense of place in large wineries because there's too many. There's just too many grapes in mm -hmm. one glass of wine. Whereas like this is from a specific soil profile in the vineyard. We do two different Bordeaux blends, which are Cabernet and Merlot. And this has a little Cabernet Franc in it. Uh, Bordeaux is the region that the grapes traditionally come from. But uh, we blend not based on grape varietal. We, we blend based on soil profile, mm. which is 
really kind of unique and different, but it's cool because wine drinkers love to hear about the land. They love to hear about the soil. They love to hear about the geology Mm -hmm. and what makes these two blocks, even though they're 50 yards apart at the closest, what makes them distinctive and unique and separate is something that people are super interested in. And it makes so much sense to me, having been around farming for so long, like your dirt is everything. Yeah. Your soil, some people don't like calling soil dirt. Like dirt is just viewed as, you know, um, dirty. Yeah. But soil is a word that reflects the fact that there's a lot going on there. Well, in the French concept, the wine word for it is terroir, which technically means earth, but Mm -hmm. it also encapsulates the elevation change, the altitude, the aspect. So, because we often plan on slopes and you get very different temperature profiles in a north facing versus a south facing slope. Do they get morning sun or afternoon sun? All of those things impact how the grapes grow. First, I'm back to the, the soil. <laughs> what soil am I tasting here? Since you know <laughs> you actually grow the grapes that make this wine, what, what is this soil? Uh, technically, I think it's part of the Warden Silt Loam series, but where it, the more interesting thing, because that doesn't mean anything to most people, the more interesting thing is the story of how the soil got there. So we are in, there's a 40,000 acre hydrology wedge. We're in the middle of the Yakima Valley up on the, in the Rattlesnake Hills. So, and there's no water here as, I mean, I'm sure you've got listeners from all over. The Yakima Valley is super dry. We get eight to 11 inches of precipitation a year. But there, when we do get rain over the millennia, sometimes we get a lot of rain in a very short period of time, and it's caused flooding over the millennia. So the underlying bedrock of all of eastern Washington is basalt. And so the hills, when they got thrust up, they're actually still r- rising. They're still being pushed up by tectonic plate movement. Oregon, those pushy Oregonians, are shoving <laughs> up on Washington and actually rotating our state. Do you tell your or- fellow Oregon wine people that they're pushy well they are (laughs) i mean they might not be as individuals but tectonic Uh, plate wise they're totally pushy (laughs) and so it's but the great thing about that which we appreciate is it's given us these beautiful east-west trending hillsides which most places in the world don't have but there are these basalt hillsides and when it over the millennia has rained a lot there have been it's washed that fractured basalt down into this part of the vineyard so there's more cobblestones. It's, they're not Missoula flood siltation, but it's, it's a really unique sort of geological feature in this area. So the f- what, what are the things influencing the flavor in the soil? Like, is it the soil life? Like all of the, you know, the whole biome that lives in the dirt? Is it the minerals that are there? Like the non-live parts of soil? What, what is it that gives it a distinct flavor to a wine well the fact that it's basalt as opposed to lus which the windblown lus is the other main component of soil profile around here um, Mm -hmm. means it has a certain amount of water holding capacity which Mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of nitrogen involved there's a certain of the the mineral all of those things the bio all of those things impact how your grapes grow and so the fun thing about fermentation is that i mean this happens with all crops it's Mm -hmm. just if you take if you take a raspberry and you just eat it as a raspberry it's delicious but the flavor compounds a lot of them are still bound to sugars and when the yeast come through and eat those sugars you actually get more flavor so all of those micro differences are accentuated in wine and that's why you can taste those differences so much more than you can in most fruits that's like if you're tasting wine or even other you know beverages that's where as you develop more of a taste you probably you see people and i know this has been true for me like move away from sweet stuff Mm -hmm. because that is to the sweet can overwhelm other character that's there unless you have enough acidity i make a riesling that's got some residual sugar but it's got really great acidity also and they're balanced and it just it's awesome it's also 10 percent alcohol so i call it breakfast wine because <laughs> remember you can't drink all day if you don't start yeah, in the morning yeah well that's true <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough job it's a tough job but somebody has to do it somebody has to. how did you learn all this stuff oh i well i grew up in the wine industry my parents okay. planted their vineyard in 92 we had mm-hmm. concords um for as long as i can Concord remember. grapes like the grape juice grapes yeah yeah i mean 
My I think parents, of Welch's grape juice when I hear we, Concord grapes. We used to sell the Welch's. Yep, now they go to Smucker's. Nice. <laughs> I mean, we had asparagus. We had hay a lot when I was really little, alfalfa. Mm. But um, my parents wanted to expand the farm, and the wine industry was really nascent and building. And so the exponential growth of the wine industry really happened in the mid-'90s, and they planted the vineyard in '92. Found out they had one of the best sites in the state, mm. and so started the winery in 2001 to really showcase that sense of place. And because I grew up in it, I made wine when I was in seventh grade. Because I needed a science project. Somehow it was, seemed logical at the time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. So, but my goal in life, as most 17-year-olds have, is, was not to stay in the small town that I grew up in my whole life. So I... Mm. Studied a year abroad with the Rotary program. I did my undergrad in Chicago. Um, I studied engineering. I got hired out of college by Fiat to go to a to go work in Italy for a couple of years, which was amazing. Crazy. So I, I drank a lot of wine there. Yeah. Uh, then I got sure. transferred back within the Fiat Group to Chicago, and I was my job wasn't that much fun. I I like to make stuff. When I worked in Italy, I worked in prototyping. We made cars by hand. It was super cool. And then I got transferred into their tractor and construction equipment division. And on occasion, I got to go to the factories, but mostly I was making spreadsheets and PowerPoints. And I'm like, wine's more fun than cars and tractors anyway. Yeah. And I like the people in the industry. I like the lifestyle. It's global. It's connected to agriculture, but people all over are interested in it. And it's so I went back and got my degree at UC Davis, which was the preeminent, it's one of the preeminent programs in the world. Um, for like, what's that degree called? Viticulture and enology. So my master's is in both grape growing and winemaking. Mm. And then I worked in Napa a couple of years, worked in Australia for a harvest, uh, did a harvest down in Argentina. And then I came home in 2009. I suppose you could sneak an Australia harvest in there because it's the opposite yep. of ours, right? Yeah, you can do two a year. <laughs> Crazy. Even though that's a long flight. It is a there. long flight. <laughs> but if you stay for, well, my visa was only four and a half months, and then I did a month in New Zealand on the way home. So if you stay for six months, it's not so bad. They make some pretty ma amazing wines down there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's... How much different is it than here? Oh, well, Australia's huge, right? I mean, it's right. a continent in and of itself, not just a country. And they have, right. they grow grapes all over in... I mean, the majority of them are in South Australia around the Barossa and McLaren Vale and Adelaide Hills and things like that. But there's, there are grapes that are, I mean, they're known for their Shiraz, but they make mm -hmm. beautiful Chardonnay over in Margaret River on the West Coast. They make really interesting Semillon, another white variety over on the East Coast and not too far from Sydney by the Hunter Valley. They make sparkling down in Tasmania. I mean, the diversity of the continent is mm. huge. I think the cool thing is the diversity in the Yakima Valley is greater than just about anywhere in the world. I mean, there's not many places where, like, we grow Riesling and Cabernet in the same vineyard right next to each other. You yeah. can't do that in a lot of places. Why? Well, combination of factors. Because with everything in egg, there's never one. It's a complex system, so there's never one silver bullet answer to anything. Mm -hmm. So we've got those east-west trending hillsides, like I mentioned, yeah. which means you can grow a lot of things on the south-facing hillsides that would not do so well in a, you know, they get enough heat to ripen. But then like our vineyard, we've got, it's a basalt promontory that was pushed up with all those, by those pushy Oregonians again. Yeah. And then, but there's a cutout kind of on the west side of the vineyard. And so there's a north facing slope. North facing slope is significantly cooler. The sun doesn't get over there until the afternoon. So with the huge diurnal temperature shift that we have, I mean, it'll be, it'll be 90 degrees and still in the fifties at night. Mm -hmm. Right, And so the fact that it actually cools down at night gives us the acidity retention for white wines, mm -hmm. also makes these wonderful age-worthy red wines. But it also means that the microclimates are so much more drastic here. And so that means we can grow grapes that normally would be in very disparate climates. Mm. Without having to travel hours to have fields yeah, exactly. in different climates. <laughs> exactly, which is great. It's... yeah. All in the same valley. Well, I, yeah. I and, mean, and you can say that because some people will make claims like that. Oh, we have the best whatever of anywhere in the world. You could say that because you have been around the world. Yeah, I have. I've been to almost every major wine growing region in the world. And 
I'm not going to say we're the only major wine region that can grow exceptional Chardonnay, for example. I mean, they do it really well in Burgundy. But the Chardonnay that comes out of our vineyard is, and some of the other vineyards in, in the Yakima Valley and in the state are equivalent in mm. quality. They're different because right. it's a different place. There's different people. The vintages are different. But that's what's fun about wine is that yeah. you get that expression of a sense of place. And then with vintage variation, you get an expression of a sense of time in a way that's really unique because it's hard to say my tomatoes from 2020 were mm. significantly different from 2019 because it's hard to taste them side by side when they're fresh. Right, right. And after you freeze them or can them or whatever, it's, you know, they just taste like homegrown tomatoes, which are delicious. Yeah. But they don't, they don't really give you that sense of what was the weather in that growing year and what happened in that growing year where yeah. wine does because it's more elegantly preserved. So to go back a little bit, was it this degree that you got at UC Davis that taught you all this stuff? Or how much of this has been learned even since then, practically growing grapes and making wine? Oh, it's both. I mean, the education's incredibly important because that has given me the, the basic fundamental understanding of all of these things. I mean, if you when you do something in the vineyard, and you want to see, you know, if you want to know how to make, how to grow better grapes, it helps to have an understanding of grapevine physiology and the basic biology of, you know, the waters are, water is different here, the nutrient levels, all of those things. If you don't understand how the plant works, it's harder to grow the plant, to optimize how your plant is growing. And so... That being said, there's nothing that you can learn in a book that's going to teach you about the nuance of your own site. And so, I mean, we've got, like, you can learn about pest and disease pressures, but you're not going to know where your hot spots until you actually spend time getting to know that particular vineyard. What was it like then with all the knowledge from your degree and your background and travels to then come back to the family farm? Well, family business, as everybody knows, farming or otherwise, anybody who knows who's involved in one, has its own unique set of challenges and opportunities. Yeah. And, um, I mean, any kid who comes home to, as an adult who's left for a while and has to figure out the family dynamics of how do I fit in as your business partner, not yeah. just your kid. Right. And, but at the same time, nobody I've never had a boss that cared about me the same way my parents do mm. I mean nobody else says you're back the same way and yeah. it's so it's really I mean it's very rewarding and it gets easier over time and it's it's definitely a different sort of balance though of, I mean the whole work-life balance thing is different when it's a family business versus a normal job yeah for sure again good and bad yeah you can just get stuff done and you, you have a certain level of family trust and you know somebody's going to do that and you're going to do that but mm -hmm. at the same time where's that boundary well you know where it doesn't take over your entire life yep especially when it's something like food and wine because mm -hmm. normally if it was a desk job you could put the computer down and walk away and go have a meal mm -hmm. and a glass of wine and it'd be relaxing yeah. <laughs> right. so that's where beer comes in <laughs> <laughs> because I analyzed wine so much when I was in grad school that, I mean, I was in tasting groups every day and I just thought about it so much that it was very hard for me to find that boundary. And one of the beautiful things about being in the Yakima Valley is we also grow so many other crops, not just wine grapes, but we grow some of the best hops in the world. And so we have some great beer. And I've found that if you're working in the, if I'm working in the winery all day, and I come home, and my mom and I often split a beer, which people think is silly, but whatever, we do. <laughs> whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. <laughs> we'll have at least a half a beer, and that's the off switch. And yeah. then we go, and a lot of the hop growers do the same thing with wine, actually. Yeah. They come home and they drink wine because it's different than what they're growing. Yep. And so, and then I can go back to wine and enjoy wine with dinner, and it's just, we can have family time. But beer is the, beer is the marker. I've never thought about it to that degree where even just sitting down and having a glass of wine could like transport you right back to work if you've been doing that all day. Again, it's a tough job. Somebody's <laughs> got to do it. 
<laughs> not that I, yeah, not that I feel terribly sorry for you, but oh, you, you should, know. you should. <laughs> so, what well, I noticed that you're like you're sort of the head honcho with the the winemaking, right? Mm-hmm. You are the winemaker. Mm-hmm. How did that transition go with your parents who had been doing it? Kind of handing over the reins to you. Well, I give my parents a lot of credit because they are not professional winemakers. Mm-hmm. And their goal was never, I mean, they were wine drinkers, mm-hmm. but their goal was never just to make wine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did it when I was 13. It's not hard. Leave some grape juice on your counter and it'll ferment itself. Nope. And then you too can be a winemaker. <laughs> but <laughs> Sure, if you'll want to have that. Well, one. that's not how you make world-class wine. And yeah. my parents' goal was always to say, we have a world-class vineyard in a world-class wine-growing region, and nobody knows about us. Because as soon as you left Washington State, people would ask the question, what side of the Potomac do your grapes grow on? Mm. Which is silly, because Virginia has a wine industry, and they call themselves Virginia wine, not Washington's <laughs> right. D.C. adjacent. <laughs> so, yeah. the, but when nobody knows that you grow things, you get no appreciation for it. You get no respect. And it was, we had in the state of Washington more 90 point wines in the spectator than any other growing region in the world. Mm. And nobody knew we existed outside of our neighbors. And so my mom and dad said, you know, it's the beginnings of the industry, but somebody has to make those benchmark quality wines. Somebody has to make those wines of, that fit in the global context. So we don't plan to make great wines for the Yakima Valley. We plan to make great wines in the world of wine. And although that's a bit of an audacious statement, it was because they had the vineyard and they knew they had the grapes to do it. But they also knew that they didn't have the winemaking knowledge. So were they making wine? Well, they were the cellar hands. But they had, uh, they had winemakers that they worked mm. with. Um, so Stan Clark was our original winemaker. He started the program down in Walla Walla uh, Community College. Stan was a legend in the industry. And um, he'd been with us in the vineyard for years. And so... Um, and Codin helped us as our initial technical consultant. So it actually, unfortunately, worked out really well that I was already in grad school because Stan passed away, unfortunately, of a heart attack. And so I came home and was wow. like, just jumped in. So they needed a winemaker. They needed stat. a winemaker. Yeah. And so I came home and jumped in off the deep end. And the great thing is because I it was very different to have a, a winemaker who would come in and help and then leave mom and dad instructions mm-hmm. versus being on site a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. We've been able to do a lot more things. So the fact that we make white wines like the Rosé and the Riesling, we've introduced the Syrah as a new wine for us. We now have a second label and we've done all sorts of different things because I've been home and able to grow it, which they would not have been able to do without, without me coming home. So they're kind of like, hey, you know this stuff, you're educated in this, Mm -hmm. go for it. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, there was also the, it's different to make wine in Washington versus in Napa and Australia and Argentina. So it, there was a little bit of that. I mean, it's always collaborative, you know, this is, and you know, initially when you come home and it's harvest and everybody's tired and you're figuring stuff out, it was a little more of a conflict you know it's a little more Mm -hmm. criticism than constructive sometimes or a lot more opposing views were expressed more strongly than (laughs) at the beginning yeah but um you know over time we've also figured out where where everybody's strengths are where everybody's real depth of experience is and Mm -hmm. we've gotten it's it's turned into a really great team because you can say you know Dad, you've been here in the vineyard forever, many more years than I have. What do you think about this? What if we, but then I'll come in and say, but you know what? The books, the science says this. Should we try this? Have you done that before? And we talk about it and we come up with new things together, which is great. And he doesn't say, nah, that's not the way we've done it before. Well, that's the beauty of science, right? Because yeah. it's, it's hard to argue with we've always done it this way. Okay. Well, the plant vine physiology says this, so let's talk about why, or, you know, the new research coming out is saying this and it's, I mean, and the other thing is 
my my folks and my whole we're very focused on continuing continuous improvement. I mean, if the goal is to be the best in the world, yeah, this is the way we've always done it. Doesn't get you there. The yeah. cutting edge is how you get to be and stay yeah. the best in the world. Yeah, and so we have the best research in the world here with WSU. We have we have world class people who've been through the vineyard. I mean, we've got all the pieces. We just have to keep continue, you know, striving and paying attention to details and keep getting better. And that's everybody's focus and everybody's goal. How common is it in the world of wine to have someone like yourself that's actually involved in growing the grapes on the ground in the field and then making the wine? Um, not, it's not very common. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's more estate wineries now in Washington, but it's more common, it's more common that people either buy fruit or they have a vineyard and they grow some of their own grapes and buy some of their grapes. I mean, there's a thousand wineries in Washington and there's only 300 vineyards. Hmm. So two thirds yeah. of them by definition can't be growing their own grapes. Yep. And there's a lot of, but I think also it's, it depends on where you are in the world. In Burgundy, it's much more common because they have very small farms and you can mm. do everything when you're little. Yep. There's kind of a size determinant where after you get above a certain point, you just can't do everything anymore. So then you get more of that separation of yeah. not being able to do everything. But it's really, really cool what I do because I'll be in the, you know, in the vineyard doing, making farming decisions, in the winery, running lab work, tasting you know, just be in my cellar hand, topping my barrels, and then I get to go to winemaker dinners or whatever and drink wine with the end mm -hmm. consumer. And most people, and not just in farming, most people in any business don't get to do the 100% complete process from the ground to the final consumer. Yeah. So it's super cool. That is cool. For, or it's just vertical integration. Yeah, but usually not in one person. <laughs> right. And that sounds so corporate to say that or something which is kind of the opposite of what you're doing too you know it's not you wouldn't describe it as oh yeah we're vertical vertically integrated it's no you're involved in every step of the process well as much you as may people, grow grew and made and shared this wine as much as people like to think of wine as being passionate and not being business related we do have to stay in business i mean yeah. we do have to make money or we don't get to keep playing yeah at the end of the day so True. yes we are a vertically integrated company good point Good point. Touche. <laughs> so, yeah, talk about that business part. What does it take to be able to differentiate yourself, market yourself, to be able to make enough money to keep playing, like you say? Oh, it's, I mean, the nice thing is because we had established the name of the vineyard, and not just us, we had a lot of people that, we, a lot of wineries that we sold fruit to, started vineyard designating and putting our name on the label in the mid 90s mm. and that was not common back in the ancient history of the washington wine industry of 30 years ago <laughs> um winemakers were afraid if they put the name of the grower on the bottle that the grower would charge more for their grapes mm. and so they thought it would be more expensive so they didn't do it and at the time as well people were people were still discovering all of where are the sites? And they were just kind of figuring out how to make wine up here in Washington in this new, different place. And it's been a really amazing evolution that now people are starting to look more for, across the industry, now they're starting to look more for where are those sites? Where are those places? What are the differentiators? I'm not so interested in Columbia Valley wine or Washington wine, although that's great. But once you get really into it, like I want to drill down into... De Brule Vineyard and this block or that block of De Brule Vineyard. I mean, that really specific, like, where are the cool sites and what is the uniqueness is a sign of maturity of the industry. So it, it because we had the vineyard name established when we started the winery, it really helped to establish, to tell people who we were. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's a combination of talking to people, pouring wine for people, and yeah. all the... I mean, we've also been lucky to get a lot of great publicity and press and um, have great relationships with lots of people, sommeliers and wine buyers around the country. And, and so 
hopefully everybody tells their friends what they like. <laughs> right? Okay. So we tasted this wine, mm -hmm. and I'm really bad at this, so I'm going to, you know, put you on the spot. What, what are we tasting here? Like flavor-wise? Yeah. Yeah. Describe it. Okay. I mean, I would try, but I just totally make a mess of it because I'm really, try. I'm you not. You should try. No, Go for no, it. No, I'm not that good. <laughs> well, I think um, our vineyard is characterized by uh, we call it Debrule cherry. There's that really pure cherry note in all the red wines that really shines through, and I think this vintage in it's the 2018 that we're tasting. Mm. The purity of fruit in this vintage is spectacular. But there's a lot of complexity. So you get that cherry. There's um, some kind of dark plum, I think, in this. There's a nice cedar note in the wood. There's a little... You can get, you get that oak, toasty oak with, and cocoa. And um, there's just... There's not a lot of Cab Franc in this vintage. Mm -hmm. But there's just a little bit of that spiciness and that really nice dried herb, um, tomato leaf sort of characteristic that yeah. comes in from the Cab Franc that's complexing and... Um, the tannins are beautiful. The structure, it's rich and mouth-filling, but it's not going to rip your rip all the enamel off your teeth mm -hmm. from the acidity or rip all the saliva out of your mouth from the <laughs> tannins. And right? So it's, yeah, it's really balanced. All those flavors that you described, where does that come from? How, how do you control <laughs> those flavors and get what you want well, some, as a winemaker? Some of them come from the grapes themselves. Mm -hmm. um, some of them come from the microbiology. Because you mm -hmm. have some yeast-derived characteristics, some bacteria-derived characteristics. Because there's, um, so you have primary alcoholic fermentation, and then there's malolactic fermentation, mm. which is when the bacteria convert um, malic acid, which is like green apple, to mm. milk acid, mm. which is so it softens the wine, it makes it more stable, protects it from other microbial spoilage issues, mm. and so you get flavor components from those. You get flavor components from the the barrels, the aging vessels, what kind of, what kind of oak, and we use all French oak, how much of it was new, who, who sourced, where did we source the wood from, so we use a variety of coopers, because you get all the different flavors from all the different coopers, mm. like some of them have more vanilla, other ones have a little more um, cocoa notes, some of them are heavier base notes and toasty, and it's really interesting to taste the same wine in different barrels, because uh, they extract different components from the different wood. So, you're known or your distinct cherry mm -hmm. note flavors in your wines. Mm -hmm. Why? Because yeah. they're delicious, and they're unique, and they don't taste like anything else. But what does, where does that come from? From the soil. It's, I mean, it's in the it's grapes. Unique. It's in the grapes. Yeah. yeah so you, you believe that's ultimately starts from the soil, yeah. the specific composition, biology, everything of the soil in yes. your vineyards Yes. gives that flavor. I actually wrote my grad thesis on stuff like this so yes i do believe it that's awesome <laughs> and that is a, you can't get more place based than that because there is no other vineyard anywhere that, that can that tastes exactly the same right right it's crazy and that's what makes it cool and so yeah that's what makes it, well that's what makes it cool and that's what makes it such a great purveyor of a sense of place and that's, I think, why wine consumers get interested in the farming and in the ag, because it's, it's more accessible than anything else, really. So what's the process of growing wine grapes start to finish? We plant Obviously, we can't get into all of the detail, but just in a nutshell. You plant a vineyard. <laughs> three years later, you get a crop. And 10 years later, your vines are mature. And so they're, um, that's when you start to get better, you know, mature flavors in the vines mm -hmm. instead of young vines. They don't have the concentration. So young vines probably grow faster, have less overall like flavor components in the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get more complexity when the vines are mature. Mm -hmm. um, so then without, throughout the growing season, we yeah. start in February, March with pruning. And in April, the buds break and... They, the shoots start elongating and growing, and then um, in June, the, the clusters go through bloom and flowering, mm. and grape flowers are really kind of cool. See, They're, I don't know anything about grape flowers. So you should follow stuff me on like Instagram. That. I post things all the time on Instagram. Well, I just started following you on Instagram. All so. right, well, pay attention. Yeah, I will be. Um, so grape flowers are 
backwards from regular flowers. They actually, the caps pop off, the flower petals pop off mm. and leave the, leave the pistils and the, um, the flower parts attached. And if the grapes pollinate, then you have fruit set and they'll mature. If not, they fall off. I think flowering's like super cool. Um, I think that's a nerd alert, but whatever. <laughs> it's one of my. Do I have a button for that? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> the um, you might need one. Um, so then the grapes. The first part of the season, they are uh, grapes fruit. It's a reproductive part of the plant. So the grape is um, developing the seed, and the grapes are hard and they're green and they're sending all these signals to birds and humans and and other animals. Don't eat me. Leave me alone. So then in August, we hit, at the beginning of August, we hit verasion, which is when the seeds are ready. And when the seeds are ready, the strategy of the plant shifts so that you're not talking about, don't eat me, leave me alone. All of a sudden, the plant says, okay, it's time to get these seeds dispersed and in the ground and make more grapes. So the, the berries soften, they change colors, they, uh, you start getting more flavor development, the acid starts going down. And they're, all of those things, as they're ripening, make them more and more attractive to birds and humans and winemakers to come pick the fruit. And, um, and ideally, except for winemakers, you're supposed to disperse the seed. But with all of that flavor development, it's, that's how you get all the interesting flavors. So then they get harvested, and then they come into the winery. And Is it really tricky to, to know exactly when to harvest that fruit? Does that make a big difference on, uh -huh. like, flavors and yeah. stuff like that? Yep. Down to, like, weeks, days, hours? Like, how um, picky it is it? It depends on the time of the season. I mean, you've got more leeway when it's cooler. You got Things don't happen as fast in October as they do in the beginning of September. But weeks, for sure. I mean, days, days generally is like i mean not so much did i pick monday morning versus monday afternoon but mm -hmm. there's a, in you the early part of the window. season there's a difference between monday and thursday wow so and the other cool thing is grapes are the only wine grapes are the only fruit that's picked based on flavor the food that you eat is not harvested based on flavor well kind of like, kind of my dad's a red raspberry grower mm -hmm. so did you bring me some raspberries? No. Oh. There's no raspberries right now. Oh. I put raspberries in I my got, You got to wait like a few more weeks and okay. we'll have raspberries. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess it's not necessarily picked on f flavor because you pretty much know what the flavor is going to be based on your ripeness. But yeah, it doesn't change that much too. I mean, yeah, it will get more sweet as it's more ripe and less tart. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty linear and you know. It tastes like raspberries. Yeah, and either they'll be tart raspberries or more mellow, like ripe to overripe raspberries. Well, but grapes are like wine grapes are like mm, the flavor isn't quite there. Let's wait a couple more days. Well, kind of thing. the difference is on Wednesday or on Monday you could be getting underripe raspberry flavors in your wine, and by Thursday you can yeah. be getting perfectly ripe raspberry yeah. characteristics. And by the following Monday, they're they're overripe raspberries. And I don't want overripe or underripe raspberries. Mm -hmm. I like my raspberries at the peak of perfection in every glass of wine. But do you pick all of the grapes at the same time then? No. You're going to harvest a field. No, a, um, uh, not, I keep calling them fields because that's what I'm used to. But uh, Well, we, we sell to, we have 45 acres planted. Mm -hmm. And we have about 14 different wineries that we work with. So every winemaker will pick their rows. Mm -hmm. So you harvest the whole, your whole section in one in one yeah. fell swoop, yeah. And that's, I guess, the difference with raspberries, too, because we harvest over the course of a month, and we, you know, run the harvesters through 12 times. So there's early fruit and later fruit, but you have that one shot where you've yeah. got to get it right. And it's probably kind of an average, I would imagine, because mm -hmm. there's probably some fruit that's a little bit yeah, there's always not quite average. ready and some that's a little bit overripe. Well, and that's why, as... Growers, we try to get everything. We try to minimize that bell-shaped curve and really tighten yeah. it up and get everything at, in that's very consistent. Because consistent, when it's an inconsistent year, it's much harder as a winemaker to make the best choice. And so, the more consistent, the more uniformity you have in the vineyard, yeah. the the easier it is for the winemakers. So you go in and basically snip off the bunches. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. 
do you have snippers with you and then you put those in like totes or baskets or something and haul them away? Well, now we have, we've got um, an all female crew that goes through. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, they're, they're really, it's a great, great group of ladies that work, have worked with us for years. Um, and they put them into buckets and dump them into bins, into half ton totes usually, and, or one ton, nah, half, they go out of the vineyard in half ton bins and mm. then go to the wineries and people will dump them into their fermentation vessels and destem and yeah, crush. Yeah, since and they're going to get crushed, do you have to be super careful with them? Yes. Because you don't want them to juice before they're at the winery. You don't want them to juice winery. before they're at the winery because mm. you can lose some juice that way, which we don't want. Right. Um, our grapes are always really clean, but if they're not clean and winemakers want to sort them, if they're worried about any sort of raisin or shriveled clusters if they're worried about disease pressure a lot of winemakers for their high-end wines will put them on a sorting table um most of our customers have gotten away from that because we know that they know that our crew won't put it in the bin if it's not going to make it across the sorting line yeah so um but it's important that the grapes come especially if they're going to woodenville or walla walla they're going to sit in a truck for two three hours four hours if they hit traffic by the time they even get to the winery. And then it's yeah. going to take a few minutes before the winery can process them. And if they're going to sit overnight because we pick during the day and then it goes over to Woodenville and gets there at eight o'clock at night and they don't have a night crew because they're small wineries and they right. harvest them or they press them the next morning. You want everything to be at as close to field condition as possible when mm. you get them. So the fact that they are hand-picked and clean and, and yeah. there's a lot of integrity, the individual berries, is a good thing. And the quicker you can get them to the winery, the better. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's great to be the winery and the vineyard are five minutes away from each other. Yeah. How big is your crew for harvest? How many people does it take for you guys to... I think last year we had seven. We've gotten more efficient, which is helpful in today's yeah. labor climate. Yeah, talk about that. Everyone's saying, oh, it's hard to find workers so you're experiencing that too well not so much because we have a very consistent crew and mm -hmm. our crew they like their jobs they love working in the grapes um and so we haven't and our crew's pretty small and tight and so yeah. it's we we usually can find all the people that we need nice. which that's that's the exception not the rule from what I've been hearing. Mm -hmm. So that's fortunate. Yeah. Again, I think it helps to have a, have, have worked for years on, you know, how do we do things efficiently so that it yeah. doesn't, I mean, there's plenty of work. It's just a question of how do we make sure that we match the people that we can, that are available with the work that needs to be done so that we can actually do everything. So what's the biggest challenge that you face to get things done? In the farm? Yeah. Or in the winery? Just timing of we've got, we have six different varieties planted. So Merlot ripens a little bit differently than Cabernet, but depending on the season, like sometimes you need to be in every block all at the same time. And so that's, that's just a logistical management vintage changing goal to hit yep. um i think for i mean we have a lot of the same challenges in farming with the weather and you know yep. how do you how do you keep your crew working when it's like last week we had that heat spike mm -hmm. i don't want my crew working on a south-facing hillside in, in the afternoon when it's 100 degrees so we have to send the crew home early because mm -hmm. we don't want to be a heat stroke and yeah, for sure. so i mean just the that kind of stuff is, it's hard to, it's just hard to get everything in. I think the other thing that's hard for us is that balance of, because we have the vineyard and the winery and doing all the other things, like, we, we're wearing a lot of hats, which is yeah. great, because yeah. it's, again, it's really fun and unique and special to be able to do all of these things. And I like to do all of the things, but it's, you know, that makes it challenging when you're trying to do everything all at once. But if it were easy, then anybody could do it. And then it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you've obviously invested a lifetime and a lot in your education and background and experience into being able to be where you are right now. So nobody could just step in and do what you're doing. So I have job security. Yes. <laughs> well, as long as people keep buying the ones. Well, and that was definitely a challenge last year with COVID because mm. how people went out and did, I mean, how people ate and drank yeah. and socialized was so a different. A lot of people have wine in social settings and not, they don't just sit and have a glass of wine by themselves. Well, conveniently, right? wine did well in COVID because more people did sit at home and mm -hmm. drink wine with their family. I mean, people were having dinner as a family. Yeah. And wine is part of a, wine is a great drink with a meal. Mm -hmm. And beer actually got hit really hard because there were no ball games and no concerts. And so yeah. beer got hit a lot harder than wine as a category. Yeah. But a lot of our wine was sold through restaurants and with no restaurants. Yeah. Like, because we're not in a lot of grocery stores, so. Um, yeah, but, where, where can people find your wine? Probably go to your website is the best way to do it, right? It's the easiest because yeah. wine's a, it's a sin, apparently. It's not food. <laughs> so we're still operating in a legal environment that is just after prohibition. I mean, there's... Crazy. It's nuts. So it's, there's states that I can ship to or have distribution in, and there's other states that we can't. Um, oh. I can ship just about everywhere, though. So the easiest way, unless you're in Washington or Oregon or other places where we have really good, strong distribution, um, it just makes sense to go to the website and come oh. to us. Because then you also get, you know, all of the all of the cool info and details and the connection to the winery, which is fun. And oh. like, if you get wine directly off the website or get on the mailing list, then you get the recipes that I send out and you get invites to my happy hours and all the other fun things that we do. So it's a growing thing though, in farming this direct to consumer. Well, it's great. I mean, it's great for the farmers because they have this connection to the consumers and it's great for the consumers because they want to know where their food comes from. They want to know where stuff is from, Yeah. but how do you know a farmer? I mean, if you don't live in a rural area, 1% of the population feeds the other 99. Mm -hmm. If you grow up in Chicago, I mean, I went to college with people who'd never seen a cow. Mm. Like, I didn't realize that was possible. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, so how do they know if those people are interested in, in milk and what's the difference between organic milk and BHT and all those things? Like, what's the ramifications of that on a daily basis? Yeah. If you've never seen a cow, it's hard to figure those things out and ask a farmer and have yeah. those kind of questions. And so the more DTC people go, the more they have that connection to where their food comes from, which is hugely important. I mean, it's not only important for, I mean, it's important for the quality of your food because stuff tastes better when it's fresher. And it's good. I mean, the, the amount of food waste and food systems have huge environmental impacts and people yeah. should understand them because it's, I mean, all of those things are impact everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, what are the, if we're making regulations based on things that we don't fully understand the ramifications for, that has huge impacts on all sorts of ecosystems and communities. And, and yeah. so it's, I mean, food's not a want. Food is a need. We all should be eating three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's good for people to become more educated in where their food comes from. And nobody knows better than the farmers. So how, what's, how do you hear from farmers? What's the thing? Direct, con, direct to consumer farmers? That way you can hear from the actual person well, I think that grew the food? This, I mean, this is a great concept, right? Like giving farmers a voice that most farmers aren't great at social media and putting things online. Yeah. Yeah. But more and more are becoming mm -hmm. better at this. Um, and I think there's a lot of those kind of tools. And if you... You might have to look. You'd have to work to get educated. But social media is always, there's more and more people putting stuff out there and there's people putting things out about ag and farming. And and like my, I've got two Instagram profiles. One is the winery and one's the vineyard. And on the vineyard, I just post stories every day. I don't post posts, but in the stories, like this is what's going on in the vineyard every day. So if you want to follow what's going on in the vineyard, there's always something. And that that's actually new in the last year. Nice. 
And it's people love it. They love following along and seeing what's going on. Yeah, what, what is it typically that people ask about or want to know about? What do people respond to the most on social media about what you do? Um, I change it up a lot because I find if I only post one thing, people get bored. Mm-hmm. So I post, they like the stories of where the labels come from. They like the geology. They like the vineyard. They like... They like the food and the wine. They like. I do a, a video every Tuesday with just talking about different stuff, and it's interesting to see what, you know, different times of the year people are interested in different yeah. things. And what kind of questions do they ask about, like how you grow stuff, or you know, is this environmentally friendly, or you know, d- I different? Think a lot of people don't know enough to ask the questions that they're trying to. Mm. Really, like people ask very vague, open-ended questions, and I'm like, I think what you really want to know is okay. this. Yeah. But you don't know how to ask the question that way because you're not quite sure how to ask that question. But I think it's great that people are asking questions because you got to start somewhere. And totally, yeah. So it's. I mean, I get. A, I think the best questions are really, "Why do you do it this way?" or "What's happening?" or just those really basic, fundamental, like the yeah, the basic fundamentals of. What, what's going on and why are you doing it that way? What is your sustainability focus? We've kind of touched on that obliquely a couple of times, but like how, how does that, uh, how does a focus on sustainability inform or change or affect how you grow wine and, or grow grapes and make wine? Well, I think, I think sustainability is important for anybody who works with the land at the end of the day because yeah. it's, it's not like you can use up your field or your vineyard and just go to the store and buy another one. It's, that's your asset. That's the thing. And I think especially when you look at multi-generational farming, like the time horizon of, like it's not just my parents farming for themselves to sell it. It's my parents farming for themselves and the next generation and to pass it along and, and leave it better than it was. I mean, most parents want to leave their kids off with the situation better than they have, right? Yeah. And so the ground is no different than... So it's... I think... I think there's a lot of things that we can do. I mean, grapes are inherently a very, very sustainable crop in the Yakima Valley. This is one of the most sustainable regions in the world to grow wine grapes because we can control pests and diseases with water management. Mm. And water is such a finite resource. It's so precious here that we are working, I mean, we're always working to optimize water because what do you do in a drought? Right. And I think the beauty of, it's, it's just super cool because all of the environmentally correct choices are also the correct choices for quality. Mm. So, like I said, we can protect against pests and diseases. We can minimize our disease pressure by having small canopies with diffuse sunlight and breeze going through. Well, how do you grow high-quality grapes? Small canopies, diffuse sunlight, and breeze going through. Mm. That's perfect because there is no trade-off between do we make the environmentally friendly choice or do we go for quality. Mm-hmm. They're, they're very, very tightly aligned here. So That's awesome. I mean, and then we do other stuff. Like we have a pond that we stocked with um, bluegill and catfish and bass, and so that. I mean, I, I don't know if the environmentally choice is to go fishing in your own pond. It's usually catch and release. <laughs> but well, it's also growing your own food then. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Unless we don't, you don't eat. I don't know. They're, they're not. The, I don't eat the bluegill. And I can't. I've never caught the catfish. Some but people love their catfish. They do. I mean, but you've got to get in touch with some kind of <laughs> southern vibe or something. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's a great blue heron that then lives there that yeah. goes after the fish and we got a bunch of frogs and we've done a habitat improvement project to um, try to build pheasant populations. And we've built native drought tolerant plants to, for, um, to help other birds and species over winter. And we've got lots of cool stuff going on. Cause I mean, also cause it's just kind of fun to yeah. see all the quail and the rabbits and the herons and the owls and the hawks. And it, yeah. it makes it, I mean, I don't know that it adds to the quality of the grapes, but it definitely makes it a cool place. So do you have, like, sustainability certifications or anything? I mean, 
There's well, we all this is a world of labels of what you're certified. You know, are you organic? Are you sustainable? Are you fish friendly? Are you, there's all these different things. We let we used to be certified fish friendly and um, live certification, which is low impact viticulture something. Hmm. But um, the live rules were developed in Bordeaux, where it's cold and rainy, hmm. and they went to the Willamette, where it is also cold and rainy and then they brought them up to Yakima which is hot and dry and they weren't they they weren't appropriate at the time and they've gotten better but um we are not certified anymore because at one point they were not they weren't the best practices for this region because what's sustainable here is different than what's sustainable there and organic is great because it's a much more codified system of farming, but it's a system of farming. It's not a. It's not necessarily a what's best practices in mm. your specific environment and crop and everything else. It's a big generic umbrella. Well, there are some people who would say, well, you know, synthetic pesticides are never a good choice in in any system. But you're saying that there there's more to the story than that. Yeah, because. The idea that something is beneficial just because it's natural means you've never been bitten by a rattlesnake, <laughs> yeah, right? That's natural. I that's mean, there's lots of highly toxic. There's yeah. lots of really bad stuff in nature that's really toxic. And, and th- I've also heard that from growers too, like cherry growers saying, "Yeah, we were organic, and the organic products that we were using to deal with our issues were killing the trees." Wow. And that was one of the first episodes, April Clayton up in Arondo talking about that. So they had to switch back to conventional with their cherries hmm. because the products were actually softer and better for their trees than the organic ones, which people don't often realize that there are organic pesticides too. Yeah. I mean, I think the difference is if you are good farming. I mean, if you're farming with the right intention and paying atten- and and also paying attention and being proactive it doesn't matter if you are spraying something that's organic or something that's synthetic if you're spraying constantly mm-hmm. so again if you keep your canopy small and let a lot of air let sunlight in there it really reduces the need to spray at all and that's a better choice than you know choice A or choice B of what you're applying and the, some of the synthetic chemistries are so good now that they're very, very targeted and very specific. And it's, um, I mean, it, it depends on your system and depends on what you're trying to do. But at the end of the day, the right choice for sustainability is paying attention to your farm, being proactive, and, and not, not putting yourself on a schedule, not putting yourself on a, oh, it's you know, June 15th, it's time to do X. Because June 15th is a phenological thing is totally different this year versus last year. Right. So, but boots on the ground farming. Farming by the calendar, yeah. Yeah, boots on the ground farming and paying attention to your land is the best way to to be both sustainable and, I mean, and just do things. And then there's all the, with everything else, there's the integrity and the intention and the ethics of the individual person. Yeah. But that's everything well with all of that though how's a consumer supposed to know you're supposed to know your farmer hey (laughs) but how can you do that and that's where it's people have defaulted to labels yeah whether it's you know whatever kind of certification because it gives them that sense you're saying that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story and i think that's right from everyone i've talked to about this issue but at the same time it leaves this gap it's like how do you really know yeah, and I think that's so in the wine industry, the Washington Wine Commission is developing a Washington specific certification mm. that is tailored to for sustainability, tailored to what we what works here. Yeah. And there's I mean, how do you know in Washington in a way is easy because you have 300 growers. So you can get to know your farmers in yeah. the Washington wine industry. How do you know, how do I know, say I know every single grape grower in Washington and then I want to go buy a bottle of wine from Australia. I think, again, wine is great because you can go to a wine shop 
and ask the people in the wine shop and they're incredibly knowledgeable and they know they yeah. know the people in the stories and the, the behind all of the bottles in their shop mm-hmm. and i don't think i mean but there's the whole wellness wine category that's popping up at the grocery store because how do you do it at the grocery store i mean how do you know with raspberries that's a challenge yeah. And what I would like to see, because they had it in Italy, and they don't, but we don't have it here, is you go into the produce section, and everything would say that it was within Italy, they would tell you what region of Italy it was grown in. And if it didn't come from Italy, they'd say these were grown in France, these came from Spain, these came from Germany. Which... A cool labeling, country of origin. Country of origin and region of origin within the, within the country mm-hmm. that you're in. Which is great, because... I want to buy raspberries from Washington while I live in Washington. I don't want to buy raspberries from, I don't know where else they grow raspberries. East Coast, California? A little bit, a lot in Mexico now, Eastern Europe, Well, I don't want raspberries from Eastern Europe because by the time they get here, it's a perishable crop. Raspberries being close to the source is, like, huge. Yeah. Well, but there's a lot of frozen. Like, a lot of the the raspberries grown in Washington are frozen. So... Hmm. Which they last pretty well. I mean, they don't last forever, but they will last a long time without really losing quality. Hmm. And that's where it has become a global market. And it, but there are other things that differentiate too. You know, what are the practices in Eastern Europe? What are the regulations that they follow? Oh, you know, of course. And how fair has the whole trade scenario been to have their product competing against ours? You know, what do they pay their workers? Stuff well, like and that. I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of, do you want to support Washington farmers? Do you want to support American farmers? Do you want to support the the client, the safety issues that we have here and all of the, and all of the standards that, that we have that we're held to? But I think, I think we need more place of origin labeling. And for now, I think some of it's got to be voluntary. But I'd love to see the retailers all say, the grocery stores all say, this is where your food comes from. Aren't they, uh, wouldn't they be worried, though? Because then sometimes, you know, with the way grocery stores work, everyone wants everything fresh all the time, even though they're seasonal, if you're getting them locally. Well, may, maybe they don't want to then have to just put out their, you know, raspberries that say Serbia on them. Well, obviously, people will eat asparagus from Mexico and Peru because yeah. otherwise you wouldn't eat asparagus in March or July. Yep. And True. so I think the other thing would be people have so gotten away from the concept of eating locally and eating seasonally and eating, well, just eating seasonally because even if I'm going to eat Washington apples all over the country, I want to eat. I want to eat things when they're in season because because they taste better. They're fresher. And I want to make sure that I don't miss, even if I'm going to eat raspberries year-round, I want to make sure that I eat the fresh ones when they're in season because why would you want to miss that? They're so delicious. And if we make our produce taste better by virtue of it's fresh and it's in season and didn't come out of like cold storage after six months, which is good, but not as good as i mean an apple that's not in season because it's been in ca for six months is not as good as an apple off the tree let's get real so the more we can give consumers the experience of the apple off the tree the raspberry off the vine you know the the pears fresh off the tree the more they taste good and the more people want to eat produce and then i mean now we're getting into all sorts of things right like that's good for health that's good for the environment that's good for people knowing where their food came from it's but it's we got a long way to go to get there yeah. because of the whole everybody wants everything all the time. And yeah. we haven't told them that there's something wrong with that. <laughs> totally. And that's a hard message to send. Mm-hmm. But it's true. And I think slowly, at least some people are starting to catch on to that. I think so. We see it a lot in the, I mean, we see it in the wine industry and you, I see it in the foodie, in the restaurants. I see it in the foodie scenes. And people are starting to, they're starting to realize that because they're starting to have more produce that's fresh and in season, and it doesn't take long to realize that it tastes better. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, 
Yeah. And you say, you're seeing it. It's I'm happening. It. Yeah. Pe- people care. But yeah. People care. They totally care. It's, it's the disconnect of, we care about these things and we want to do the right things. We just don't know. We just don't have the information. Like you were saying, how do people, how do we get that information? Mm-hmm. So the more, the better of a job that we can do as producers to give them that information and help them find what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, oh, those consumers, they just don't understand farming at all. It's their fault. <laughs> well, it's also our job to educate them, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's so much opportunity. So we just have to do a better job of it as an industry, as farmers. But then they'd have to like talk to other people and a lot of farmers like to be out on their field by themselves and not talk to people. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so true. Do you prefer that? Just be out in the field? You know, I love, me my, alone? I love my job because I enjoy, obviously, talking to people and sharing what we do. But there's also days where I love the winery because there's no <laughs> windows, there's no cell phone service, there's no internet, and I just awesome. put some music on and do my own thing. And yeah, it's great. I like both. Well, thanks for having me here, sharing your wine with me. I'm glad you like it. It's delicious. And yeah, I've only had one. I need to, now I need to try them all. Now we have to go. Yeah. We have to stop talking and start tasting for real. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But thank you for being willing to share your story and just, yeah, straight from the heart, what's going on. Well, thanks for having me. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 